Talbot, I have a question for you. Who do you think is stronger, your dad or Randy? Your dad, okay. I need uh, Randy and Chris to both come up here right up in the front. They didn't know about this, obviously. So Chris, you think you're stronger? No. Yes, you do. <laughs> I brought with me two hammers today. They both have a similar appearance. They both have a rounded head on the end. This is the one for the strong man. And this is one for the man who wasn't, isn't as strong as he once was. So you, you hold the handle very, right at the very end, and you take that and you hold it straight out like that. And we'll see who can do it for the longest. <laughs> no, I, went, I don't want to deal with bloody noses today. <laughs> Here, I'll take them back, thanks. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have a bloody nose, but... So Doug, there you go. He wondered why that was up here this morning. So now I have another little test for you at this point in time. I know we're, we're going to read scripture next. Just don't get ahead of me. There was a man who was farming and he had 17 cows in his herd. And it came time to make a decision. He either needs to get more cows and better equipment, or he needs to give up milking and just be a grain farmer. So he decides that to, the reasonable thing to do is to give up his herd. He has three sons. And by a family codicil that had been going on for generation after generation, here is how the division was going to happen. The oldest son would get half of the flock, or the herd as you may call it. The middle son would get one-third of the herd, and the youngest son would get one-ninth of the herd. So he's thinking about this and thinking about this. Well, how do you divide 17 cows? In half? Eight and a half cows? He doesn't want to kill one of these cows. It's still producing good milk. So he's been thinking about this and thinking about this. He hasn't said anything to the boys. The boys all have their own farms and their own herds. And so his neighbor comes over one day, and they're talking, and he shares this dilemma with his neighbor, and his neighbor said, I'll be right back. And so his neighbor walked to his farm and came back leading a milk cow. He said, I'm going to give you this cow. So you now have 18. So half of 18 is 9. One third of 18, 6. One ninth of 18 is 2. So 9 plus 6 or 15 plus 2 is 17, and the farmer took his cow back home. <laughs> you have to figure out how that can happen. The answer is, it does not add up to 1. If you use the lowest common denominator, it would be 9 eighteenths plus six eighteenths plus two eighteenths, it only adds up to seventeen eighteenths. And that's where the one left over comes in. Who here can quote John chapter three, verse fourteen and fifteen? You all know John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How about 14 and 15? Any takers? Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So you've witnessed here today three tests. One was a physical test. One was a mental test, and one is a spiritual test. Let's read God's Word together. Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11. I will be preaching from Matthew's Gospel from now to Easter. We will not necessarily be doing a verse-by-verse -verse exploration. That takes years. We will be doing some highlights. 
and I can prove that to you. <laughs> we will be looking at passages of Scripture in Matthew's Gospel from now until Easter. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and, and attended him. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. Three tests. You had three tests this morning, or you witnessed three tests this morning, and these are the three tests of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. It is right after his baptism. I think that's significant. When is God going to attack a believer? the most, immediately after spiritually high moments, right after a person has trusted Jesus to be Savior and Lord of your life, you can expect the devil is going to attack. Right after a person has committed their life by following him in baptism, Satan is going to attack. Jesus has been out and he has been baptized by John, and now Satan is attacking. He has been up on this mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and he has been fasting. Really? 40 days and 40 nights? That's a long time. That's a long time to go without food. That's a long time. Especially when you consider where this takes place. Right outside of Jericho is a mountain and it begins the part of the ascent up towards Jerusalem. And the Mount of Temptation is located there. And that's where Jesus is during this period of 40 days and 40 nights. He's up on top of this mount, now called the Mount of Temptation. And what is his viewpoint? Jericho. Jericho is one of the most lush, and wonderful places in all of the earth with all kinds of fruits and vegetables and with good water and with all of those things and that's Jesus' vantage point. B hasn't been feeling good for several days and for a while this uh, issue of uh, intestinal things or abdomen, uh, she didn't want any food for a little while and you know when you don't feel like eating any food is when they play every commercial on TV <laughs> for food. Or at least perhaps you notice them then. Jesus is up on top of this Mount of Temptation. He's been there for 40 days and 40 nights. He has been praying and fasting He's had the view of Jericho right down over the hill from him. All of the good foods and vegetables and fruits and so on. And on this year's, this past year's trip to Israel, we had a wonderful feast in Jericho. We stopped at a restaurant, had a meal that I've never had before, and it was wonderful and plentiful. And that's Jericho. Satan comes to tempt him to ask him three questions, to test him three times. But it begins by saying, if. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. 
And I want to tell you, that'd be a pretty wonderful thing, wouldn't it? Jesus is the bread man, after all. He's been born in Bethlehem, the city of bread. That's what Bethlehem means, the house of bread. He is the bread man. You want to read about Jesus and the bread man, read John chapter 6, and they'll tell you all about that. Jesus is the manna that the people of Israel have been looking for for 40 years when they've been out in the desert. Oh my, isn't that peculiar, the similarity? Jesus is where? In the desert. Where are the Israelites? In the desert. The Israelites are there for 40 years. Jesus is there for 40 days. Uh, the Israelites pretty much fail this test. Jesus nails it. If you are the Son of Man, tell these stones to become bread. Imagine all the things that you could do if you could make stones into bread. You could feed the world, couldn't you? I mean, bread is one of the common things that most people in every society in every part of the world eat. Whether you're rich or poor, you eat bread. I love bread. I like it too much. I look more like the Pillsbury Doughboy all the time because I like bread. I've never met bread I didn't like. I like whole wheat bread. I like rye bread. I like white bread. I like wheat bread. I love pumpernickel bread. I like Gary soda bread. I don't think I've ever met a bread that I didn't like. And it shows. Tell these stones to become bread. Now Jesus, quite frankly, is capable of this. And Satan knows it. <coughs> But we don't do things because Satan wants them done. We do things because God tells us to. And Jesus answers this test. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He quotes to him from Deuteronomy. It's not about bread, you see. It's about whom you serve. We believe that the Bible is God's word. We say it is useful for teaching, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the person of God, the man of God, may be thoroughly equipped. Our answers are here. This is the first test. It's a physical test of Jesus. The testing isn't over with one simple question. There's another test to follow. On this test, Satan <coughs> quotes scripture. He takes Jesus over to the temple up in Jerusalem and he stands him on the highest point of the temple, the pinnacle of the temple, and it's at the southern wall and the distance down to the ground is, I don't know, 120 feet or more. And he says, throw yourself down from here. For God says, he will command his angels concerning you and they will guard you and lift you up in all ways our guardian angel passage of scripture. Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to a test. This is a spiritual test. This is, do you know who made you? Do you know to whom you belong? Do you know all of those things? We don't have to memorize the Bible. It's a good thing to memorize Scripture, and I encourage you to do that. But, you know, when we get to heaven, God isn't going to say, can you quote all of Psalm 119 for me? There's 176 verses in Psalm 119. We'd be there for a while. It's not a spelling test. God isn't going to ask us to spell chrysanthemum. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> I wouldn't do well on that. It's, have you hid your word in my heart? What have you done with my son Jesus? Is the question that the Lord will ask of us. Have you trusted him to be your Savior and your Lord? Or do you just know about him? 
So then Satan takes Jesus up on a very high mountain. And he says, bow down before me in everything that you see. And they have a view of the whole world. Everything that you see, I will give to you. I want you to understand, Satan has the right to offer that. Because this world has been given over to the wiles of Satan. God has created it. But we live in a fallen world today. God is going to redeem this world. And he tells us that in the book of Revelation. He tells us exactly how it's going to happen. And there will be a day when there will come a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth have passed away. <coughs> but as for now, Satan has his way, more or less, in this world. Wow. Have you thought about that before? I mean, isn't it kind of obvious if you really sit back and Think about it and study and look and see what's happening in our world and what's been happening in our world for thousands of years. Satan has lots of reign in this world. You know, at the beginning of the book of Job, uh, one day God is sitting on his throne. He's always sitting on his throne. One day God is sitting on his throne and uh, the angels are attending him there and Satan comes into the Lord's presence and God says to Satan, where have you come from? And what is Satan's answer? I have been wandering to and fro over the face of the earth. It's his to wander around. And God says, consider my servant Job. Satan says, of course he's going to serve you. Look what you've done for him. He has a beautiful farm, he has a beautiful family, he has all the crops, he has all the cattle and the, and the flocks and all those kinds of things. God says to him, you may take it all away from him except his own life. And Job undergoes a test. A huge test. Satan is in charge of this world. Don't forget it. And so when Satan shows Jesus all of the world's goods and pleasures and all of those kinds of things, he says, bow down before me and I'll give all of this to you. And Jesus responds, get away from me. Satan. And you know, if you say that same thing to Satan, he will do the same thing as what he did in Jesus. He left him. He left him. I like music. I'm not a musician, I'm a drummer. Drummers are just people who hang out with musicians. We don't read music, we read rhythm. But I like music. I like music of every variety and stripe. I have never yet a, met a variety of music that I didn't enjoy. Some I enjoy more than others. If you ask me who my two favorite violinists in the world are, I can answer that question. Itzhak is one of them. Charlie Daniels is the other. And you do know the difference between a violin and a fiddle, don't you? A violin has strings. A fiddle has strings. <laughs> Charlie Daniels did a song many, many years ago. The devil went down to Georgia looking for a soul to steal. It's a great song. I love that. Chicken and bread pan, take it out, down. <laughs> Love that song. Satan is always there. He has many delightful things to, wonder, to, to make you wonder and to offer you. And they are his. They belong to him. This world belongs to him. For now. But there will come a day called judgment. And Jesus gives us an example 
of how we deal with the tests in our life. I knew when it gave Chris the, uh, that was only an 8-pound sledgehammer, man. I could have brought a 16-pound one, you know. It, <laughs> so I thought I had to carry it in from the car, you know. I know that the 8-ounce hammer and the 8-pound hammer have similar function, but for different purpose. And I know that it's a play when I tell you that a man has 17 cattle and he's going to divide them using the formula that I gave you. And I know it's a challenge when I ask you if you can quote the two verses before the most quoted verse in the Bible. I don't know what your test in life will be. And there will be many of them. It's plural. But this is what I know. If you rely upon the Lord and upon his word, you can succeed and will succeed at every one of those tests. It's not always easy to undergo testing. I understand that, and I think you do too. And we've all been through tests of different kinds. Some perhaps are physical tests. Some perhaps are mental tests. And some are definitely spiritual tests. In whom do you put your trust? You will invariably deal with testing in all three of those areas in your life. And if you have your eyes fixed on God, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, you will not go wrong in your times of testing. When I was a child, there was a man who lived down the street from us. And he was kind of my hero because he was such a big man. He was kind of a Hoss Cartwright kind of a guy. You know, just big. You have to be my age maybe to know who Hoss Cartwright is. But, John, you do. You know who that is. And my, my dad's friend, Jim, worked for a boat-making company over right outside of Columbia, Pennsylvania. And he took us over there one day to show us how these wooden boats were made. We went over there and there was a whole big skid full of mahogany wood. And he said to me, Michael, go ahead and pull one board out, no matter which one it is. Just pull any one board out that you want and give it to me. And so I sorted through this big pile, must have had 160 boards in it. And I pulled out one mahogany board. It was a one by four, 12 foot long, I suppose. And I gave it to Jim, and he leaned it up against the pile. And Jim was a man who was excess of 300 pounds. He was a big man. And he started walking at one end of the board, and he walked until he got clear up on top of the pile. <clears throat> He said, do you know why I did that? I said, no. He said, because I wanted to see if this wood is any good. If this wood would have broken when I walked up on it, I'd have sent the whole skid back. He was putting the wood to the test. He said, I do that with every pallet of wood that comes here. I take one board out and I walk on it while it's leaning up against the skid to see whether it can withstand the test. I know that in metallurgy there is something called the Rockwell hardness. You measure the strength of steel based upon its Rockwell number. I know that in wood it's called Jenga. You test wood at its strength according to its Jenga strength. I know that testing proves us. Are we ready? Or are we not? A few years back, a couple years back, I guess it is, 
Jory Tobias came in front of the Vocations Commission for his licensing exam. And he was a bit nervous that day. In fact, he was more than a bit nervous. He was a whole lot nervous. And I understand that. We all understand that. We've all sat in that chair, too, at some point in time or another. And Jory was so nervous that he, he dressed and came with one brown shoe and one black shoe on. And didn't even notice that until he was sitting waiting for his appointment. And the first thing he did when he came in the room, he says, i got to tell you this. I have one brown shoe and one black shoe on because I was so nervous today about what might happen in this testing process. So the first thing we did was pray for him and prayed with him. But we asked those questions of people who want to be a pastor. And they need to be able to answer those questions sufficiently. We put them to the test. Quite a number of years ago, I was teaching in an undergraduate program. I was teaching a psychology class. And I had mostly freshmen and a few sophomores in this class. I had about 30 students there. And I gave the first exam. And it was really pretty easy. But before I gave the exam, the student said to me, grade us on the curve. Come on, please, grade us on the curve. And I said, you don't know what you're asking. Oh, yeah, yeah, please, grade us on the curve. And I said, okay. So I gave them the test, I collected them, and I scored them. If you had 100%, you got an A. If you had 99 or 98%, you got a B. If you had 97%, you got a C. 96 and 95 were Ds, and anything 94 or lower, you failed the exam. Wait a minute, you can't fail us for having a 94%. I said, you asked to be graded on the curve. And a pure bell curve has the same number of A's and F's, B's and D's, and the C's are lumped in the middle. You can't do this. I said, I've only given you what you've asked for. I let them stew on it for about a week. And then I relented and gave them the score based upon not grading on the curve. We are put to the test. And if you're here this morning and you're undergoing testing, that's a good thing. It may not seem like a good thing at the moment. I understand that. But you will be strengthened through the testing process. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Use his word as your guide for daily living. And you will be fine. Whether it's holding out an eight-pound sledgehammer. Whether it's figuring out a math formula that doesn't add up. Or whether it's knowing God's word. Knowing God's word is the most important. Pray with me. Father, we thank you this day for who you are, for what you've done, for the love that you've shown us in your son Jesus. Thank you that you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. When we have trusted you and you have resided in our life, you have come to be with us eternally. We know that you are here and a part of us this day. We know that we have testing to undergo. May we be strong enough in faith in you to pass any test that would come our way. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat>